We're going to be uh, considering questions about the, uh, let's see, I want to make sure it's working up there, okay, about the eye and uh, <coughs> the problem, <coughs> excuse me, the problem is that uh, evolutionists uh, keep suggesting the eye could have evolved by itself. The most famous book on evolution uh, published in the United States uh, by Douglas Fuchalma states that, uh, you know, the evolution of eyes is apparently not so problematic, so improbable. Each of the many grades of photoreceptors, her eyes from the simplest to the most complex serves an adaptive function. <coughs> What he's inferring here, of course, is a great variety of eyes that you work for and they, they adapt. So that means they evolved. Every eye, you know, there's all kinds of eyes out there. They adapt. And since you have all different kinds, of course, evolution is very versatile. On the other hand, <coughs> the Bible has an entirely different story here. It says in Proverbs 12, 20, 12, the hearing ear and the seen I, the Lord has made even both of them. Got the contrast, of course, this is the issue. <clears throat> the eye problem. <clears throat> uh, Darwin addressed this quite a bit in his book. We talked about this earlier and so on. They have a great variety of eyes. And then he suggests, you know, well, if you have survival of the fittest operating for millions of years and millions of individuals, they might produce living optical instruments superior to one of glass. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, to his one of glass, probably he's referring to a telescope. Uh, so just give natural selection enough time, enough people, and so on, it's, it's going to work. Uh, other evolutionists have taken up the same theme. Uh, Simpson at Harvard talks about, uh, as, our, as Darwin does, that since all eyes from simple to complex are functional, they all have survival value. Not, uh, that's the evolutionary mechanism, of course. Uh, Dawkins, Oxford University, suggests that all eyes are useful and provide survival value. Uh, Douglas Fuchelma proposes that the various eyes have survival value and advanced features like the lens would evolve starting as a vitreous mass. The lens being a very important part. And I, I comment down here, the mind needs to be kept in perspective that eyes can provide survival value whether they evolved or they were created by God. Keep that in mind. Survival doesn't mean evolution. Just a few pictures about variety of eyes uh, so you know a little bit about the problem we're going to talk about later on. Uh, there are two general kinds of eyes out there. Okay. Uh, there are the simple eye that just detects light, maybe direction a little bit, uh, but it doesn't make an image like you, your, your, your eyes do. Your eyes put a picture together. The, the more advanced uh, eyes we call image forming eyes. So we, we, we got these simple eyes that detect light. We got these others that make a, a picture, and the one that makes a picture, of course, much more complex and uh, uh, much more versatile. Uh, here's some simple eyes. 
Uh, on the left there, you have a dinoflagellate. Uh, has a lens and a pigment. Pigment's where the, the retina is. And uh, that's a protozoan. They have eyes. Um, earthworm in the middle. Uh, arrow points there to a light detecting area. That's useful in collecting light. Earthworms have uh, these detecting structures, especially abundant at the ends of their body. Uh, flatworm planaria. It has this, this pocket of uh, pigment, as you can see there in the right picture, and uh, nerve fibers connecting to it and so on. And uh, it can detect, maybe can see direction a little bit. That's debatable. Then there is the uh, eye of snails. And uh, these have been important in the discussion by evolutionists. Because you have a great variety of different kinds of eyes and snails. Uh, on the left you have there a little pocket. In the middle you have a more complex one. At the right you have one. Uh, which seems to have a lens in it. And it's debated whether snails can pick up direction or not, uh, but not pictures. It is not an image-forming eye, uh, as far as we can tell, as far as snails are concerned. Then we get to the image-forming eyes, and there we find four different systems as we look at the various animals. There are more than that, but these are four main ones. <clears throat> and uh, the, these are, uh, one, the compound eye, uh, which is uh, so common in insects, the simple camera eye, which is your eye, uh, and then we have the pinhole eye, which is just a, a hole going into a cavity, and the scanning eye. Uh, the scan like a television uh, camera, it, it's, it scans to pick up uh, the picture going back and forth. So those are four basic types. Uh, before illustrating them, let me point out a couple of things. Uh, in order to make a picture, you have to have precise focusing. And here in this picture, the light comes in from the left here and goes uh, I'm sorry, it comes in from the right and goes, let's see, make sure I get it where you see it up there, goes to your left. And uh, you have a lens, that whitish structure there, and that lens has to focus the various rays onto the retina, which is at the right, that sort of brownish structure at the right. Now. The yellow lines, you follow them, they do not focus on the lens. And when they get to the lens, they are way out of focus. You have a very fuzzy picture. Focusing is extremely important in getting a, uh, a sharp picture. The red lines, you see them cross right on that retina, uh, right, in, right at this point right here. And of course, there you'll get a sharp image. As long as the light rays are focusing on that point, you'll get a sharp image. But if you, the blue lines, they go beyond the retina, and it depends on the shape of your lens over here as to uh, uh, where those will cross. Way beyond here, but where it crosses the retina, it's, it's very fuzzy. Hence the, the importance of, of, of focusing here. Uh, fish eye has a different kind of lens than you have. You have an elliptical shape uh, eye. Fish eye is a spherical. And how could that focus? Uh, this is a, a trick that is uh, worthy of a high respect. Uh, it has a gradational index of refraction in the lens that varies. Uh, and it's said to be higher in the, in the center of the lens, uh, and so on. And uh, hence, a spherical uh, lens is able to focus the light all in one spot, as you can see at the red arrow there. Uh, so fish have this, other organisms have it also. 
Uh, just the fish to uh, show you that. And fish move their eyes around. They have muscles that move the eyes. Uh, they have uh, fairly sophisticated uh, eyes and can see quite well. Uh, get into the four basic types that we were talking about. Compound eye, the most common eye found in insects, uh, is, is very uh, complicated structure made by a whole bunch of little tubes they call omatidia. Uh, here's one omatidium right here, uh, which would be this part right here. Here going, it goes on down here to here and hooks on to a nerve and so on. And uh, then you have all these different omatidia there. A dragonfly, you know, has these great big eyes on its, on its head. Uh, it'll have 30,000 of these omatidia, each one pointing in a slightly different direction and the light coming in through that omatidium uh, put together to, to make an image. So th this is the compound eye. You can understand why it's called compound because it's so complicated. Then we come to the uh, camera eye or the, the simple eye or our eye to speak. Uh, it has a lens right here for the focusing and the light focuses on the retina along here, and it focuses especially in the fovea, and you've got 30,000 little cells there in the fovea that uh, put together the picture that you're seeing on the screen right now. Uh, you're, seeing, you're using your fovea to see that. And, and your lens changes shape for focusing close by or distances. A fish doesn't change the shape of its lens, it just moves the lens back and forth. And when it wants to see close things, it moves the, this ball forward and so on. So focusing is very important in, the, in, the, in order to get a sharp picture. Uh, and then we got the uh, pinhole eye chambered nautilus, uh, you know, that, that organism where Alver, Alver Wendell Holmes wrote this famous poem about the ship of pearl and so on, the chambered nautilus. It has a different kind of eye, a pinhole eye, it has no lens. It has a hole said to be one millimeter in diameter and uh, a light, uh, supposing you have a, an object out here, uh, uh, just a little spot. Uh, to, he, the only place it's going to show up is down here uh, as it goes through that hole on this part of the retina. And the organism is able to see without uh, all kinds of uh, other features. And uh, it just has this pocket here with the retina on the inside. And this pocket is filled with seawater. Uh, then we have the uh, scanning eye, which is an unbelievable thing. <clears throat> In 1891, uh, this little copopod, copila, uh, was described. The thing is small. It's only one millimeter wide, two or three millimeters long. I mean, it's a teeny little thing. Uh, it seems to have a rather unique uh, visual system. Uh, uh, the red arrow there points to uh, lens. It has got two of them, one on either side there in the front. And uh, that sees and sends light in, and then it's got the scanning feature. And it wasn't until 100 years later uh, this was described in, in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, some scientists went to the marine biology uh, facility there in Naples, Italy, and they wanted to see this again. They took sample after sample, day after day, couldn't find it. Finally, by the 10th day, they got a load of them. They had hit the right spot. 
Uh, every day they go out and collect a big pile of plankton and so on, and couldn't find it. But they found it. And they looked at it more carefully, and they noticed that uh, this lens, the green arrow you see there, uh, vibrates back and forth. What a strange thing. Well, and it's the focal distance of this lens is right to this point here. And this lens here is looking at the picture here and picking it up by scanning back and forth. And uh, it, when the scanning lens here, you know, the, this special lens here, when the scanning lens is going out towards the outside of the body, it goes slowly. When it comes back in, it just jumps in. It scans out and jumps in. Uh, so sometimes uh, it'll take two, two seconds, actually, to do it. And sometimes it'll do it five times per second and so on. Uh, just before it's going to take off, it scans off very fast and so on. And it's just using this system to see. Uh, there are muscles there, of course. You have to have nerves attached to it and so on, but it's an entirely novel system of seeing, uh, the scanning eye. Uh, it's been reported in some mollusks, uh, possibly maybe scanning also uh, some other copepods. Uh, seem to have this and so on, but uh, copila has been studied a little more carefully. Very interesting type of eye. Well, uh, so you, you have these four optical systems, and uh, each kind is different. They're so different that uh, evolutionists, some of them recognize, hey, this this could not be a series, as Darwin had talked, from simple to complex, and the other folks were talking about the survival value of all these. Uh, this could not be the case. That they had to evolve independently. I mean, look at that scanning eye system, you know. It's so different. Uh, you could not evolve one from the other. Uh, you'd have to start from scratch. And uh, this idea uh, uh, prevailed, and we'll get to it in just, just a minute, but I just want to mention three, three problems the variety of eyes pose for evolution in terms of the distribution through the, through the animal uh, kingdom. Uh, there are one, a there we find advanced eyes in simple organisms and simple eyes in advanced organisms. Not what you'd expect from evolution, gradual evolution, more advanced and more complex your eyes should get. A B, evolutionary eye animals have similar eyes. And C, organisms that are closely related sometimes have very different eyes. It doesn't fit the evolutionary uh, pattern. Okay, an example of finding advanced eyes in simple organisms, simple eyes in advanced organisms. Uh, this, this is a, a fascinating organism right here. On the left side there you see uh, the head of a worm. Uh, this only thing, oh, around five to 10 millimeters long, I mean, one centimeter long and so on, uh, a millimeter wide. Here's this little worm, it's a marine, uh, found ma many places on the earth and the oceans. Uh, but look at its head, it's got eyes right here that have a lens. Here's this teeny little one millimeter worm that is, uh, these eyes have muscles on them, the eyes move around, look at, he's looking at stuff. And when you look at a cross section of the eye, as you see on the right side here, uh, he's got a spherical lens. Uh, but he has a cell secreting uh, 
region right here that uh, produces more material here to, to make sure that lens is in the right place by uh, adding more distal vitreous fluid here to this. So it has a focal mechanism, uh, not for quick change, but at least uh, to keep the eye working sharply. So here's this teeny little worm out there uh, with these eyes and so on. Uh, that's a rather simple organism. And then you, you get to another organism. Uh, and this is the Ampioxus. Uh, it's just a little stick, maybe about a 10 centimeters long. Uh, lives on the surface, sticking out of the sand and, and the beaches, especially in the eastern part of the globe. Uh, I mean, the Far East, I should say. Uh, and uh, it does not have any eyes. But this is the classic ancestor for the chordates. It's, it's a member of the phylum chordata, which is the most advanced phylum we have. And it doesn't have an eye. Uh, but it has, uh, look at me, you look in the literature, and they'll say, oh, it has eyes. You know. It, it, it doesn't have a structure they can call a functional eye, is the way to say, but uh, they have a light sensitive area, they call it an eye uh, sometimes. But it's, it's in the nervous tube, the neural tube there, and this is why this is considered, uh, the neural tubes in the dorsal part of the body and so on, like vertebrates have, it's got myotomes, uh, like we have, you know, our ribs and our, um, uh, other structures that are kind of lined up that way and so it's considered an ancestor to to the vertebrates but the most advanced phylum here and not even have an eye well uh, you have evolutionary isolated animals have similar eyes uh, let me show you this evolutionary tree here this is um, supposed the way the way the things evolved, and you, you start with a single cell down here, and you have two main branches here: protostomes on the left and deuterostomes on the right, and uh, it's considered uh, a very fundamental step when you get about the eight-cell stage of the embryos of these on the left there. Uh, they have this spiral cleavage. They don't divide linearly. They divide kind of like a spiral. Uh, and so these are all considered to be, have evolved together because they all do this. Uh, Deuterostomes uh, on this side, uh, that includes starfish and uh, vertebrates like us, you know, and so on. We're, we're, we're uh, deuterostomes that are different. But you find the same basic anatomy of eye in, in some of these as you find over here. And they're supposed to have evolved 630 million years ago. And that, that's uh, making certain assumptions. They don't find the fossils there at all. Uh, but uh, assuming rates of genetic change and so on, they say that's, that's when they separate it out. Well, uh, Looking at some of these, uh, this is a deuterostome that's like us. It has this camera type of eye. That's fine. But then you go look at a squid, and it's got a camera eye. And it's a protostome. So what, 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 such, a, such a major difference between these two. Uh, And uh, how come? Because they, they evolved so long ago when they were such very simple organisms and so on, they produced the same eye. Well, the evolution say, well, it's just coincidence, it's convergence. They just, they, they just happened to evolve together uh, uh, the same way, at least we should say. Uh, this is the eye of, of a, uh, a squid. It's not like that. The largest eye we know of is the eye of a squid. Uh, 
one of these eyes that washed up on the uh, shore of New Zealand. It's 40 centimeters in diameter, if you can imagine an eye that size. It has a billion light-sensitive cells. I mean, this is a, a huge eye, bigger than a basketball. Uh, and this is a cross-section, how what it looks like uh, uh, cephalopod, not just squid, octopus has the same kind of eye, and uh, cuttlefish also, and so on. But uh, this is it here, it has a spherical lens, has an iris, it has a cornea and all this, muscles, ciliary muscles, uh, that change the uh, shape of the eye, or the position of the eye by, by, by changing the shape of the eye as a whole. And of course the retina is back here and so on and so on. So uh, there's that eye there on that part of the evolutionary tree. Uh, octopus, very interesting creatures. Uh, note the eye there, it has a slit eye like a goat has. And uh, when the, uh, during courtship, that pupil turns round. Uh, and during uh, conflict, great big round pupil. Uh, but uh, normally it's a slit eye and there's a, sens a slit type of sensitive layer for your fovea uh, in the eye of the octopus. Uh, anyway, he, this is uh, the protostome. Uh, also, like the like the uh, squid. J just to compare the similarity of these two, uh, to the left is the cephalopod eye, and uh, to the right is the vertebrate eye, and you notice how similar the structure is. Uh, there are some differences. The lens. Is, this is a spherical lens. This is a elliptical lens. Uh, this one changes shapes, this one moves back and forth to focus. Uh, retina is a little different than these, but the basic structure is, and uh, the question has been there for m at least, this, well, o over a century. Why are these so similar? And uh, the answer, well, this is convergent evolution. They just, they just both went the same way. Uh, a lot of convergence there, of course. Uh, Then we have organisms that have very closely related, sometimes have very different eyes. Uh, I just want to check here a second and see. Uh, examples of, that, of this are the chambered nautilus, of course. It is part of the squid family uh, cephalopods, they all class cephalopoda, same class. These uh, arms that you see out here, these extensions that you see right here are considered the same as the arms of a squid, uh, the, um, or the uh, arms of an octopus and so on. And it has that simple eye I was telling you about, the pinhole eye. So here's a closely related type of organism, these are all mollusks, uh, members of the phylum mollusca and so on. And the eye of the chambered nautilus is just totally different from the eye of the squid or the octopus. Uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, they work. But does it, why did evolution do this? This is a puzzle, of course, and uh, uh, very closely related are in a very different kind of eyes. Here, here's the eye of the uh, chambered nautilus we talked about, the pinhole eye. Uh, very simple compared to the eye of the others uh, in the same class. Well, the evolutionary solution. Uh, Evolutionists have decided, at least some of them have decided, well, uh, you, they have to evolve uh, separately. They're too different. Uh, and the classic report on this is uh, 
South Indy Plow, Plowin and uh, Ernst Meyer at Harvard uh, wrote this 1970 paper on the evolution of photoreceptors and eyes and so on. And uh, they say, well, probably, possibly the eye evolved maybe 40 times, maybe 65 times in evolution. In other words, you have eyes evolving by themselves all over, not one type of eye from the other. Uh, they're too different, and uh, uh, they're in, in organisms that uh, have different evolutionary backgrounds and different structures in the eye that they consider to be uh, fundamental. Uh, that can be debated. And so this classic report has uh, kind of been respected. In the end, they conclude the, the blue lines here. The result of our analysis completely substantiate Darwin's claims, but also reveal numerous still unsolved problems. Well, I, I do challenge uh, the results of our analysis completely substantiate Darwin's claims. Darwin claimed that you know you evolve one eye from the other and give enough time over millions of years and millions of organisms, you're going to get you know a, a, something better in a telescope. Uh, uh, they come and say no. Different eyes must have evolved maybe 40 times, maybe 65 times. They're saying something exactly opposite of what Darwin is, uh, was saying. So uh, that particular uh, part of the first part of that blue uh, quotation there is in question. Um, then we have uh, evolution's incomplete eye, and this is uh, gets into the more m recent. Uh, days or years, I should say, uh, and that is uh, an article that came out in 1994 by Dan Nielsen, Suzanne Pilgrim, and the article is titled A Pessimistic Estimate of the Time Required for an Eye to Evolve published in Proceedings of the Royal Society of London, Part B, and so on, a uh, very respected journal. Uh, what is the conclusion of this? This is uh, what they need to, tr how are you going to get all these different kinds of eyes to evolve here and so on? Well, uh, what you need is fast evolution. And so, and they say they've got a pessimistic estimate of the time required for an eye to evolve. Well, uh, roughly, uh, it takes a while to digest this, and I'm just going to quickly go over it. They say, I evolved from a light-sensitive patch. They, they, what they do is they try and say, how fast could an eye evolve? And they, they, they're using uh, the simple eye. Uh, the camera eye like you have, and mammals have, and so on. And uh, they say, I evolved from a light-sensitive patch, and the accumulated 1% increases equivalence to a linear increase of 80 million times. In other words, from their original, and they, they don't give you the measurements on this, it's frustrating. Uh, but uh, from this simple thing, uh, there were 80 million uh, advancements. How long would it take to do that? Well, they say I could evolve in just 829 steps of theoretical because uh, in that 80 million figure, this is a uh, geometric progression type of figure. Uh, they had 1% and then they had 1% to that 1% increase the next time and then and so on, uh, so that the figures get bigger and bigger as, as you go along. And then uh, using the power of that, they, they 
get, uh, here's your equation right here, if you can follow right here. Uh, they, they get this to eight, uh, 1,829 steps, down to 1,829 steps. And then they put in population factors. How's this going to spread through population? Uh, and they say it would take 363,992 generations uh, for a simple eye to evolve from light. And here are their figures, how they get that 363 generation by the, using the power. Uh, much lower figure here that because they've corrected for population genetic factors here. Um, and this is how they get this uh, 360 gener 64 generations, or thousand generations, I should state, uh, for for the development. So, and uh, they say, well, and you could have one generation per year because most of these organisms live one year, and so it would take 360 thousands years to develop to evolve an eye. Now that's a very short time concerning geologic time, you know. And so this has been uh, very much uh, appreciated this article because it helps uh, explain the the eye has been such a problem to to evolutionists. They conclude that there's enough time since the Cambrian for eyes to evolve more than 1,500 times. So this is, this is what uh, evolutionists were looking for. Uh, here's their model. Uh, they, talk, they start with a flat, sensitive plate. The retina is already there. Uh, then they bend it down, and they claim optical uh, validity uh, improvement actually uh, as you go further and more here and uh, the eye gets uh, more of a pocket like a simple eye and a, a lens develops in there you know uh, right proteins come to, to be localized there to produce the lens and uh, they claim they have positive survival value there all along the way along. Uh, and pretty soon you get to this eye. And uh, it's only taken you uh, 364,000 years to do it. Well, uh, how valid is that? Uh, <clears throat> Notice this, this is evolution directed to its goal. No side steps are considered. No calculation details are shown. This is very frustrating. How are the exponential growth factors established and combined? You wish you'd see the arithmetic there. The development of a lens with a mathematically ideal distribution or refractive index may at first glance seem miraculous. That's what they state there, I'm quoting from the paper. And then they propose use of proteins identical to similar proteins from other functions. Somehow they got in there and they formed the lens. And then they say selection has thus recruited gene products that were already there. Okay, so the proteins were all there and they just came there and pretty soon you, but they admit it seems miraculous. Um, quoting from them again, the nervous tissue of the vertebrate retina can also be ignored as this is clearly a part of the nervous system which just happens to reside in the eye. Here you've got all this important nervous tissue in your eye to see stuff. Well, that's not part of our game here uh, because that's part of the nervous system. Without a nervous system, you're not going to see anything. How, how, what good is an eye you can't see with? 
uh, is a very simple model compared to reality. He started with suctional patches, not quoting them. Uh, the quotations are in quotes here. They start with a functioning patch, hence they are not evolving an eye as they repeatedly propose. Anyways, they are mainly modifying an existing retina. Well, let's go on further here. They conclude by stating, in this context it is obvious that the eye was never a real threat to Darwin's theory of evolution. And I would comment, as long as you leave the complicated parts out. What about the focusing mechanism? Well, let's get to that in the next slide here. Uh, their proposed model cannot be taken seriously because my part they are not considered. And the missing parts here, the retina, the most complicated part of the eye is left out. Uh, the brain part to interpret what the eye sees. What good's an eye if you don't have a brain to interpret what's being seen? Uh, that is not considered. Nerve connections between the eye and the brain, that is uh, not considered. Uh, you gotta have a brain that works, you gotta, be, you gotta connect to that eye uh, in a very functional way. Uh, a functional gradation le gradational lens, they make a vague suggestion, and as I've gone over that, you know, just the right protein molecules assemble themselves there, and pretty soon you had this uh, gradational uh, <clears throat> type of eye uh, that uh, could focus. Uh, Lens focusing mechanism, they don't talk about that. Uh, pupil size, they talk about the pupil, but the pupil size adjusting mechanism, they don't talk about uh, that. Uh, their, their eye, in embryology, uh, uh, the eyes of vertebrates, for instance, develop from the nervous system. They don't develop from the, something at the surface. And these are two basic different kinds of tissues, ectoderm, mesoderm. Uh, and you, you have to uh, have a complete different embryological system to switch from that w one part of their model to, to uh, what we commonly find uh, in, in vertebrates where uh, the eye develops not from the skin structure but it develops from the nervous system. And then the muscles that move the eye, you know. Octopus has six muscles. We showed you that little worm has three, and you have six muscles uh, moving your eye, each eye. So it's, it's a rather incomplete uh, evaluation, but evolutionists, has been, the eye has been such a problem for them. As soon as this came out, here, here are some of the statements that, that came out in the literature. Richard Dawkins, Oxford University. 1994, the same year the paper came out. The results were swift and decisive, and time required for the AVI is a geological blank. Uh, Daniel Osorio at Sussex University talked about Darwin's sh shutter stilled. This is the, the article uh, title, uh, Darwin, uh, and he points out here uh, in the white figures here, the, the eye has been such a problem for evolution that it's sometimes referred to as a Darwin's shudder. Well, it's been stilled by this article. No more problem, folks. Uh, internet, <laughs> the eye has turned out to be, be the best proof of evolution. Uh, this is uh, interesting. Uh, fortunately, they, they, that's been taken off. I, I, I checked the, uh, the original page there on, on, the, on the internet. They, they've taken that statement out. Uh, 
Well, uh, so that was the immediate reaction to this. Uh, there's been little reaction in the creation literature to, to these details of this article. Uh, but an uh, uh, interesting article came out in two or three, nine years later, by David Berlinski. And it's, it's titled, A Scientific Scandal. And uh, it's, uh, it was published in Commentary, which is uh, put out by the Discovery Institute uh, in Seattle. You know, these folks uh, promote uh, design, but not creation so much. They just say, well, design is scientific, creation may be religious, and so on, so but, but there is design. Uh, that is the mantra of, the, of that uh, institute there. <clears throat> well, th we're going to read a little bit from what, what uh, this rebuttal, I might say, to uh, uh, Nielsen and Pelger's article, the, the claim, you know, you could evolve the eye uh, so fast. They say, Nielsen and Pelger's work is a Critique smorgasbord questions are free and there are second helpings. He's really hitting them. He, th th this uh, man has somewhat of a sense of humor. Uh, numbers make an appearance in each of their group graphs. The result is his claim of certain elaborate calculations, but no details are given either in the paper or in its bibliography. The calculations to which they allude remain out of sight, if not out of mind. What is their justification for the remarkable and strong assertion that morphological transformations purchase an optimal amount of visual acuity at each step? They claim every step is better, or you're not going to have survival value, of course. No population figures are given. There are no quantitative estimates of any relevant parameter. Why is selection pressure held constant over the course of 300,000 years or so, when plainly the advantage to an organism of in increasing light sensitivity change at every step of the adaptive slope? Uh, <clears throat> Why do they call their estimates pessimistic? That is conservatism. They're saying, oh, yeah, we've been pessimistic rather than wildly optimistic. You know, overlooked so many things, you know, of course. At one point, they convert the steps into generations. But a step is not a temporal unit. And for all anyone knows, each step could well require half again or twice the number of generations they suggest. Why do Nielsen and Pelger match steps to generations in a way they, they do? I have no idea and they do not say so. Well, they, you know, in their calculation, they switch from the 1% change to, to generations. Uh, and uh, this is, there's no reason for that connection. Curious about this point, this is a computer simulation. I, this is Berlinski, you know, the man that wrote the, um, the rebuttal. I, I wrote to Dan Eric Nelson in the late summer of 2001. That was two years earlier from the rebuttal. Dear David, he wrote back courteously and at once. He was unaware, of course, that uh, Dan was uh, not supporting uh, his viewpoint. And this is what he said. This is Nielsen replying to Dan Berlinski. You are right that my article with Pelger is not based on computer simulation of eye evolution. I do not know of anyone else who has successfully tried to make such a simulation either. 
but we are currently working on it to make it behave like real evolution it is not a simple task. At present, our model does not produce eyes gradually on the screen. It's not working. But it does not look pretty. Oh, it does produce eyes gradually on the screen, but it does not look pretty. And the genetic algorithms need a fair amount of work before the model will be useful. But we are working on it, and it looks both promising and exciting. Well, hope springs eternal. Um, this is, uh, that was included, that letter was included in the rebuttal, of course. And, uh, uh, Berlinski concludes uh, his rebuttal, he says, why in the nine years since their work appeared have Nelson, Nelson and Pelger never disassociated themselves from claims about the work that they know are unfounded. And what should we call such a state of affairs? I suggest that scientific fraud will do as well as any other term. Um, and I should add here, uh, I had it on my other computer, but not in this version that I copied. Uh, I copied this version before I had added that sort of thing. That uh, these folks had, uh, going back here just a second to, uh, uh, Dawkins here, you know, he said here is swift and decisive. And Dawkins then, uh, in his book, The Rivers of Eden, in 2005, I think it was published, 2005, he talks about how the computer, uh, on the computer the things worked out beautifully and things were swift and decisive. And uh, Berlinski uh, points that out and so on, and that's why he says, and what should we call such a state of affairs? I suggest that scientific fraud will do as well as any other term. Well, uh, Nielsen, rebuttal to the rebuttal. Uh, published in the same journal. He says, I appreciate the opportunity to respond to David Berlinski's essay on the 1994 paper authored with Suzanne Pelger called A Pessimistic Estimate of the Time Required for an Eye to Evolve. And that's the, a, scientific, a scientific scandal. Uh, so on April, so on. Because it gives them credibility, I generally do not debate pseudoscientists, but I've decided to make an exception here. And uh, here are some of his comments. Mr. Berlinski's next move is to list the important information he claims is missing in our paper. At regular reveals, he repeats the phrase, they do not say, but all the necessary information is there I cannot reply individually to every point here, but two examples will do. Mr. Berlinski claims that there is no unit of morphological change and that we do not explain how we arrive at a sum of 1,129 steps. Those were the 1% steps that we talked about earlier, 1%. Uh, but Explanation for Rogoff are given on page 56 of our paper. Well, it's true they discuss it on page 256, but it, this is a gray area in a way. Uh, they do discuss it, but the details are not there that you need to recalculate it. He further claims that we fail to explain how morphological change relates to improvements in visual acuity, although pages 54 through 56 
together with the graphs and legends and figures one and three, deal with exactly that and in great detail. Well, <coughs> they certainly deal with that, not in great detail. That is, uh, uh, you're, you're left wanting in that article as to what really is going on uh, in that respect. For the rest of his essay, Mr. Belinsky focuses on the issue of whether he believes that he has detected logical flaws. He is not right in a single case and instead reveals an insufficient background in visual optics, simple theory, uh, sampling theory, basic evolutionary theory, and more. He's not to have read a whole bunch of different uh, references. Without such knowledge, it would be hard to grasp the details of our paper. But it is standard scientific practice not to repeat lengthy reasoning where a short reference can be given. In other words, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, this is in the rebuttal to the rebuttal by Nielsen. Mr. Berlinski right, is right on one point only. The paper I wrote with Pelger has been incorrectly cited as containing a computer simulation of evolution. And uh, we mentioned how, how that was done earlier. Uh, I have not considered this to be a very serious problem because a simulation would be a mere automation of the logic of our paper. They admitted that it didn't work. They notice uh, he admitted that it didn't work. Uh, a complete simulation is thus of more scientific interest, although it would be useful from an edu educational point of view. Well, it, it would, but it also helped convince some of us that the system works. He goes on to say here, uh, he's getting back to Dawkins, who said, hey, he did it. They did it on the, on the computer, and uh, the results were, you know, uh, definitive, you know, and very fast, and so on. Our paper remains scientifically sound and has not been challenged in a peer-reviewed scientific journal. I do not intend to take any further part in a meaningless debate with David Berlinski, Lund University, Lund, Sweden. Okay. Well, he, <coughs> but, uh, <coughs> so now Berlinski uh, comes out of a rebuttal, to the rebuttal, to the rebuttal. Uh, in uh, commentary, the journal commentary. And this is what, this is the rebuttal to the rebuttal to the rebuttal. Uh, it says, in quotes, a scientific scandal. I observe that Dan Nielsen and Suzanne Pelger's paper, quote, a pessimistic estimate of the time required for an eye to evolve in an eye was a critic's smorgasbord. There are so many things wrong with it that even a, the, the finickest of eaters could leave the table well satisfied and ready for a round of Alka-Seltzer. But in itself, there is nothing here that suggests a scandal. Dan Nielsen is a distinguished scientist and uh, witnessed his discovery and so he gives a whole bunch of scientific papers that uh, Nielsen has written and so on and down at the end here it says, together Susan Treasure, he has simply written a silly paper, in spite of all the fact that he has these good papers, but this one is silly. It happens, and in the literature of evolutionary biology, it happens very often. So going on here with the rebuttal to the rebuttal to the rebuttal, um, as I have many times remarked, I have no creationist agenda whatsoever, and beyond res re respecting the injunction to have a good time all the time, no religious principles either. Evolution, long evolution, it's all the same to me. I criticize their work, not because its conclusions are unwelcome, but because they are absurd. Okay, so it goes on. Um, this is, you know, uh, <coughs> Berlinski's rebuttal to the rebuttal to the rebuttal. 
Writing about a compound eye, Nelson himself has remarked that it is only a small exaggeration to say that evolution seems to be fighting a desperate battle to improve a basically disastrous design. Okay. Then he goes on to say here, uh, <coughs> Uh, then he's uh, optics and energy compound eye and so on. He, this reference is not so important. Whatever the desperate battle going on among the arthropods, there is no battle at all taking place among the vertebrates and cephalopods. Nielsen Pelger's eye moves from triumph to triumph with serene and remarkable celerity. So he's criticizing the uh, original article again. The main problem with the uh, Nilsson Pelger NP model is that although evolutionary path, that although the evolutionary path that it is desc described might be a legitimate one, it neglects consideration of divergent paths. Use, use standard genetic algorithms emulating natural selection of multiple factors. These algorithms develop over years are sometimes used in diagnostic of aircraft engines. Sorry, this is a, you know, I know what I'm doing here. Okay, um, this is an, another paper that was published criticizing the original Nelson Pelger paper. And um, I thought I was still in um, Berlinski's paper, but no, this is by, Dove Rhodes, and it says, approximating the evolution time of the eye, a genetic algorithm approach, a thesis, and that's the Department of Physics, Indiana University. Uh, what's Indiana Department of Physics doing? You'll understand probably in just a minute, uh, worrying about uh, the evolution of the eye. The main problem with the NP model is that although the evolutionary path that it describes might be a legitimate one, it neglects consideration of divergent paths. And that's the, the basic problem. They're saying, hey, evolution doesn't work that way. They use standard genetic algorithms, and those are out there, there's, there's all kinds of algorithms out there for evolution. And they use standard genetic algorithms emulating natural selection for multiple factors. These algorithms developed over years are sometimes used in diagnost diagnostics of aircraft engines. In other words, these are basic principles that mathematically are used and can be used uh, in physics studies as well as biological studies. In that uh, thesis, he concludes that the Nelson Pelger model neglects to, neglects to consider locally optimal evolutionary paths, tends to underestimate the evolution time by at least a factor of five. See, they have not taken into consideration that evolution might not just produce a direct trajectory as they propose. They go one step to the other, every step is better. No side trips at all. And on that basis, they say, well, you, you, uh, it could be five times as long, and probably more. Earlier they state, if our previous speculations have merit, an order of magnitude would ramp up the estimates to 18 which uh, to 18 million generations, which according to uh, Nelson Pelger, each generation is one year. So this would take 18 million years instead of the 360,000 years that Nelson Pelger had originally mentioned. So there's been this criticism of the thing where that they didn't go into uh, details that are accepted uh, as algorithms. Well, uh, in concluding here, 
and I'm sorry we started so late and uh, we're a little bit late here. Uh, I'm going to skip number seven here, and uh, it's just an anatomical challenge to, to evolution, and just come to our conclusions of what we have discussed here. One, a variety of completely different optical systems are used by animals to form images. Two, the pattern of distribution of different viewing systems throughout the American kingdom confounds proposed evolutionary relationships. You know, they're two varied systems. They could not evolve from each other, is what we're saying here. Three, because of this, some evolution is proposed that when a new kind of eye appears, it represents a new evolutionary lineage for that eye. Yet, Darwin and others suggest that since we have a variety of eyes, from simple to complex, that all work, this illustrates how survival could produce simple to advanced eyes, which is, there is some tension between these two approaches. Uh, which which of the which one of these do you have? Which is it? Uh, you can have uh, slow, gradual evolution all the way through, as Darwin advocated, or you can have different, uh, separate things. Uh, you need to decide which argument to use. It quite often both arguments are used, and uh, they are in conflict with each other. Is what we're stating here. Next, <clears throat> the Nielsen Pelger paper itself suffers from one. It deals mostly with only the framework of an eye. Notice there's a difference between the time required to build the framework of a house and providing the rest. They just discuss part of the eye. It is not pessimistic as they state, or conservative, we might say, when it overlooks the most complex part of the eye, like the retina. Three, it does not provide enough information for evaluating its major conclusions. D, the time calculations ignore normal variability and are too short. And lastly, their mode provides no clue for the formation of the most common eye found in nature, the compound eye of arthropods. They've centered on the simple eye. Arthropods far outnumber everything else. If you want the most common eye out there, well, you know, uh, are in insects. Uh, arthropods form three quarters of the different kinds of animals. And, uh, you know, they're abundant. Uh, well, there are one million ants, supposedly, one million ants for every person on the surface of the earth. Uh, there are bugs everywhere. They have this compound eye. They have not picked the most common eye. For, for discussing it, they've picked the, the simple eye. Uh, they tried a valiant effort, but uh, so uh, this is where we are in the thing. Evidence are claiming victory. Uh, others are saying, hey, uh, that is not the case. Uh, the major problem with the evolution of the eye is generally ignored by evolutionists. Complex systems with interdependent parts like visual systems of copia have no evolutionary survival until all the essential parts are present. Why would the lenses and copia form when you can't have a scanning system uh, and all the different parts of the scanning system? Uh, you're not going to have survival until everything is there. Uh, all essential parts the system are present so as to be able to provide the needed survival. Until then, excess non-functioning parts are only cumbersome impediments. This is a reducible complexity problem. And I, I wish to uh, emphasize this impediments here thing. Actually, the survival of the fittest system should get rid of all those extra parts that are useless. They're cumbersome, they're in the way, and so survival of the does works against developing gradually complex systems that have interdependent uh, parts. 
Well, in concluding, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord have made even both of them. Uh, science stands by that verse very well. And I might say uh, we can have confidence in the Bible and, and uh, because of that. Uh, in concluding, I would say, you know, th this has uh, obviously been a battle, a battle, and uh, uh, it's, it's a, a public relations battle to a certain extent. Um, I, I, I don't approve of calling it scandal, for instance, and so on. Uh, we need to communicate with these folks who uh, have different views than ours. Uh, we need to understand them. They, they think they're honest. They think they are uh, correct and that we are wrong and they need to straighten out uh, because we want to get, we want to find truth. And they, they're sure that evolution took place. Uh, keep that in mind uh, as we think about all this. Uh, we need to be uh, understanding and tolerant, but certainly uh, the facts uh, say that uh, the eye did not evolve and their attempt to try and show it is a total failure. Uh, maybe that's pejorative, but it, it is a failure. So any comments? It's ten, yeah. Oh, <laughs> so we I didn't keep these away, so there wouldn't be any comment here. You might want one here. Uh, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't understand how this uh, most di distinguished scientist in the world writing these papers, uh, doing these computer uh, simulations, and at the end makes, it seems to me, uh, them wrong, like scientific uh, fraud. Why they are doing that? Um, you're uh, you're questioning why we should say they're wrong. Yeah. Uh, because nobody wants to prove himself it's wrong. I'm not sure I get in your question. Uh, why don't they know that they're wrong when they're so far afield? Well, you know, uh, the mind the mind takes the shape of the uh, container you put it in, uh, and uh, they uh, they feel that evolution has taken place. They feel that creation is wrong. And uh, they've got to show that evolution works. And uh, they feel justified and they feel honest and they do it. Uh, even though there are problems, the, the ruling paradigm of evolution prevails. Uh, and uh, Scientists are not, you know, we see, we see the scientists as, you know, here's the white coat, uh, unbiased evaluator of data there, you know, and so on. Uh, that's not the case. Science changes its views time to time, and you're, you're wrong. Every time you change your view, you show that science is wrong. So it's the way sociology of science works. One idea is good for a while, another idea is good for a while, and if you take, take like the, uh, the um, plate tectonics model, you know, when 
in the in the 1960s and so on. I, I lived through all this. I was taking geology courses then. <coughs> uh, if you uh, believe that the continents moved, you were laughed at. And in five years, if you didn't believe that they moved, you were laughed at. Uh, science is has a sociological component to it, and uh, that's why that's why we we, we see this uh, type of thing. Uh, the important thing is to stand by the facts. Uh, and uh, that's the safer place. Interpretations, be cautious. Um, I think if I'm understanding correctly, I think that what's behind the question that was just asked is, okay. why is it that the science feels that evolution must be right? Because it, it is as if they need evolution to be right, only right, and nothing but right. Because every other alternative is unacceptable. Um, when we uh, find ourselves in that kind of a situation where we have an a priori commitment to a particular position, regardless of the evidence, that makes it very difficult for us to then correct it in the face um, or in the presence of evidence that would call for such a correction. Uh, so then the question becomes is, how do we learn anything if we have a priori commitments to certain positions. That becomes a major challenge because it, it essentially undermines our mm -hmm. ability to even learn. And that's, that seems to me a major uh, problem and a major violation of the very intention of science in the first place, whose sole purpose is to actually be able to learn something. Yeah, that, we could um, elaborate on this uh, quite a while. Uh, humanity has changed its modes of thinking reason was very popular in antiquity. Uh, then we, we had the, the Middle Ages where authoritarianism was, was the, you know, you, you accepted the authorities. And then we had the Renaissance and uh, <clears throat> uh, Newton and so on. Uh, others brought forth the scientific ideas that uh, <clears throat> hey, th things are, are uh, work according to materialistic, at least materialist factors and so on. Uh, Newton was not a materialist at all, uh, but uh, he introduced ideas that favored that. And uh, so we're kind of in that po position right now, uh, except that uh, postmodernism uh, is, you know, anything goes, I mean, whatever you feel like, uh, type of thing. So uh, we need to keep that in mind that uh, <clears throat> there, there's, when, when you see all these errors in a paper lauded, like this one was, uh, and all the problems with it, uh, it, it suggests, you know, that uh, objectivity is not complete. I, I think, you know, you look at these details, uh, there's got to be a designer. Why? Because design seems obvious there. If there's a designer, uh, I'd expect he'd communicate with us, 
Um, I think the Bible is the most uh, logical communication from that designer as I look at various uh, sacred writings over the world. Uh, and it makes more sense and it makes good sense for a science. The Bible talks about cause and effect, which is a strong basis for some scientific thinking and so on. So, uh, I feel that is a better route than to just follow the temporary mechanistic dominance that we have now in science, where God is not allowed in the picture. Um, it's, it's a serious thing that uh, science has enclosed itself in a box. Well, everything has to be mechanistic. Uh, it has to be uh, <coughs> fit into uh, matter and motion type of thing. Uh, while things are so complicated, you know, it, it's got to be something beyond this. And uh, so I, I, that's that's my suggestion. Yeah. A uh, couple of questions. First of all, is there a reason, or why do they only have one year for a generation? <laughs> and sorry. Uh, yeah. Then about. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I can see Ber that Berlin in a small... Berlins Berlinski asked that question, you know. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a jump they make, you know. Hey, one year, one generation. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, one, one generation, one year. Their population genetics uh, was rather simple. Uh, but I'm not a postulant genetist. I can't guarantee you, except that when uh, uh, roads came out and with the established things and said, hey, it's wrong. Obviously, they were too simplistic in their population genetics. So. And secondly, um, they, they seem to, and, and I realize evolution does this all the time, assume that each of the, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, um, each of the advances mm -hmm. in per generation are going to be advantageous to the organism. Um, but they, how do they explain this? I mean, things that happen by chance are not always to the advantage. Yeah, but no, there is, is there doesn't appear to ever be any explanation as to yeah. what happens when there is a so-called setback. Yeah, you're right to a certain extent, but the the conversion they made from one percent change, you know, uh, you probably don't remember the figures, but it went one point oh one for the first set of figures they obtained to after they'd done the population studies it went to 1.0005 so they're giving much slower process there might have included uh, they were using some some standard uh, evolutionary thing so I, they may have included some of that in there, uh, per se, but obviously they didn't do enough, or otherwise uh, roads would not have come out and say, hey, you know, it's, it's 18 million years instead of uh, 360,000, uh, 64,000, and so on. <coughs> When, when there are evolutionary changes, shouldn't we see the intermediates? All these different variations should also have offsprings with the variations that would be extant. Yeah. And so, instead of distinct jumps. Um, but uh, I wanted to respond to Danilo's comment on the a priori we, as creationists, very much have an a priori commitment, just like you accused of, of the other side. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I think Dr. Roth, the um, reason uh, scientists insist on materialistic explanation 
is because that is the only tool they have. They, mm -hmm. they say that supernatural is outside their capacity to examine and, and mm -hmm. understand, so they arbitrarily restrict their explanation of, the, of our world to materialistic uh, uh, mechanisms, uh, which is in the, within the, uh, their ability to study in the lab. And, and uh, folks, materialism works very well. Folks, it, it's a science. I just love science, you know. Mm -hmm. It's uh, cause and effect, and you got all these mathematical quantities you can put in there and so on and so forth. Right, but and, and don't so... Don't limit reality <coughs> to just what the, 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 your you use can of, handle. Your use of the word box is the correct one. They, it's all right that they restrict their uh, examination to what they can actually mm -hmm. do, but they at the same time exclude any possibility of something else than materialism. That's mm -hmm. where they are mistaken. <clears throat> and uh, take take issues like the origin of life, you know, uh, classical mention is so so impossible. The very to very point. Uh, you you're forced out of materialism uh, sooner or later, and then you go a little further. Why is there anything instead of nothing? Yeah. Uh, you're you're. I mean. It breaks down. Our our minds are it's, it's too simplistic. Uh, but we have to do the best we can, including science, folks. Science is very good. Yeah. Um, to quote Sherlock Holmes from Arthur Conan Doyle, when you rule out all of the alternatives that you can, then what you're left with is probably the most likely answer. <laughs> yes, so what, sure. what, what he's meaning to say is, well, that's if you can demonstrate that of the alternatives that we know and understand, you can eliminate them as the likely explanation for something, then we have to consider uh, the remaining alternatives we had not considered yet. That are more difficult to analyze. That, that would be more difficult to handle. Yes, yeah. we cannot put God in a test tube. That's, yeah. That is a problem, but it doesn't mean that he doesn't exist. This, this was the reasoning of the Athenians when they <clears throat> erected a monument to the unknown God Athens mm -hmm. was suffering of a terrible plague, and they sacrificed to every god they knew mm -hmm. to stay the plague, and it didn't work. And so that's when the Conan Doyle principle came in. They decided there must be another god they didn't know, the unknown god, yeah. and so they better mm -hmm. erect a, a monument for it and sacrifice to it. And yeah. Paul opened that door. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, very good. Well, thank you for staying by so long. Thank you so much. Sorry it was started so late. <laughs>